This episode of the Productivityist Podcast is brought to you by My Next Big Thing, My Next Big Project. That's right. That's not a joke. This episode is brought to you by My Next Big Project. I'm going to share with you what my next big project is, or at least how to learn more about my next big project during this episode. So stick around for that. And now let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Productivity is Podcast. My name is Mike Vardy. I am your host. And this week on the show, I am joined by Humble the Poet. He's otherwise known as Canmore Singh. He is a Toronto bred MC spoken word artist. And he is the author of the book Unlearn, which has just come out not too long ago. In fact, we recorded this interview just before it came out. And you know, we had a real great chance to connect when we both spoke at the 2019 edition of Think Better, Live Better, put on by my friends Mark and Angel Chernoff. And, you know, uh, it was just two Canadians getting together. That's right, from from Canada. Uh, we were we were just became fast, fast acquaintances, so much so that I know we've had a chance to connect back and forth uh, ever since then. Uh, we've talked about, um, you know, a fellow Canadian who is now uh, going to be a late night talk show host on NBC, Lily Singh. Uh, you know, so we had a great conversation just talking about his book, but also talking about, you know, the lessons he learned along the way, the lessons that he hopes the book teaches, and so much more. Uh, we're just going to get right into it. Here's my interview, my conversation with Humble the Poet here on the Productivity is Podcast. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Humble the Poet to the Productivity is Podcast. Humble, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Mike. You have a book that's just come out called Unlearn 101 Simple Truths for a Better Life. And we had a chance to meet at Think Better, Live Better, uh, hosted by Mark and Angel down in San Diego. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with you and your work, I mean, we gravitated towards, as soon as I hear you're Canadian, it's like, okay, hold on, there's another Canadian in the house. And we kind of <laughs> gravitated towards each other at that point. But beyond the Canadian component, can you share with my audience, for those who are unfamiliar with you, a little bit about yourself? Well, I have a very nice beard. That's, this is that's, true. This is should, true. <laughs> yeah, we should start with that. But um, yeah, I'm a Toronto born and bred uh, boy, child of an immigrant. My parents came from Punjab in the 70s. And uh, I uh, grew up in Toronto and I was working as an elementary school teacher and then just trying to find art uh, as a way to, you know, kind of scratch a creative itch while at the same time impress the many women I wanted to impress. And uh, it took a life of its own. And uh <clears throat> After working and doing art on the side and putting my music on YouTube, uh, I, I I pulled the trigger and I went full time after receiving an offer for a production deal to write music for another artist. Uh, that deal went sour, and then I found myself unemployed, about eighty thousand dollars in debt, um, and no way to kind of earn money because I had no idea how to. And I was I was living by myself, isolating myself from the rest of the world, and turning to Tumblr to find motivation to feel better and realizing that most of the stuff I saw in there was just empty and hollow. Uh, so I began writing myself and I just kept writing and writing and writing until I actually felt better with pragmatic, sustainable words. And I began sharing that on Facebook. I used to share a post every day on Facebook. And uh, after a couple of months, the biggest comment I used to receive was, you should write a book which I didn't. Instead, I took all my writings for that year and I put them together to compile this book, which is 101 Simple Truths. And I published it independently. And that was a couple of years back. Uh, and then as things got a little bit better for me in the art world and I was making money doing other things. Uh, the book just wouldn't go away. People kept discovering it, falling in love with it. Certain celebrities found it, gave me plugs. And then I got picked up by Chapters Indigo, uh, who's the biggest bookstore in Canada. They put it on their shelves and it became an instant bestseller and it was on the bestsellers list for about nine months. And uh, now I'm making my big American splash on April 9th with, with the book. And uh, I'm really excited. This book has, has, has changed my life, saved my life. And I know it's connected with everybody who's taking the time to open it and just even read one page. So I'm pretty unconventional when it comes to productivity. The idea of, you know, uh, I'm not so uh, bullish on the whole efficiency effectiveness part. And then I look at a title called unlearn 
And, uh, you know, immediately people are like, what, like, so what does that mean? What, what to you, you know, I'd ra- I think I know I have an idea of what it is, but for someone out there, there's like, okay, what am I, what am I supposed to unlearn? How does, what, what can you, what are people supposed to get when they look at this and say, oh, okay, I know there's simple truths in here, but what am I unlearning to get to those? I think I think the first thing is, is kind of understanding the idea that we've been so conditioned to acquire more and keep adding and adding to our lives under the assumption that the more we have, the better off we'll feel. And I think for me, my experience working with children and, and working with very young children helped me realize that, hey, you know, we all started as empty vessels. And a lot of the things that we think are kind of like permanently tattooed onto our soul and our being were actually socialized into us. And some of those things that may have come in handy when we were kids or teenagers as survival mechanisms or coping mechanisms are now kind of weighing us down and holding us down as adults. And the idea of unlearn is, hey, let's focus on getting to know ourselves and letting go of the stale and expired qualities that we may have uh, so we can feel lighter and we can fly higher as opposed to continue adding more. We don't have to learn some new mystical piece of wisdom or acquire a new skill all the time to improve the way we feel about life. Sometimes we just have to let go of the old shit. One of the things that you would have had to have in your arsenal, uh, not just going through, you know, kind of the ups and downs of a, a creative career, but also working with children is patience. How, how important is it to you and how important is it, especially in a world today, which seems to be all about go, go, go fast, fast, fast. I need it now. This immediacy is patience. Because, uh, you know, I think that that's I think it's something that's lost. And for someone that is really trying to, you know, either move forward with this uh, idea of, you know, kind of uh, adopting counterintuitive, you know, kind of lessons. Uh, how how important is that that virtue of patience uh, in, for, in, in terms of what you think? I think patience is absolutely essential. I think the first step is really recognizing what patience is. I think a lot of people now think patience is waiting around um, and, you know, letting things, you know, do what they do. But I think what people have to realize is patience isn't sitting around doing nothing and twiddling your thumbs. Patience is recognizing and respecting the time it takes for things to, to manifest and happen. <clears throat> and what happens is a lot of us kind of burn out or get demotivated because we have such high expectations and such low patience. Um, you know, whether you're trying to go to the gym and lose 20 pounds, like it's not going to happen in a month. And people get very discouraged when they don't see the results quicker. And I think if a lot more people stretch their timelines uh, to really uh, be in line with their goals, you can't have big goals and low patience. So I think from that perspective, patience is essential. As a teacher, definitely, you know, working with kids, you know, these guys are bananas. So you have to, you have to be very patient. And uh, the second skill that's probably even more important to being patient is being adaptable. Uh, you know, you gotta, you have to roll with the punches. You're not always going to be in control of the entire day and all the factors that kind of come with it. And again, I think, uh, what, what one of my buddies said perfectly is that good things happen to those who delay gratification. You know, now there are so many, uh, avenues for that short, quick, convenient, and cheap dopamine drop, uh, that you can get into your life that people are no longer, uh, you know, <clears throat> delaying the gratification for something bigger and that's the thing the longer you delay the gratification the more you can just put in the work and and deal with all the challenges that come with that it's it's bigger the payoff and the ideal situation isn't even to focus on the payoff ever it's just to have fun on the rainbow and not concern yourself with the pot of gold and i think that'd be the ultimate patience which is just literally respecting the time it takes for things to manifest you and I had a chance to chat about um, a friend of yours, Lily Singh, who's known as, you know, Superwoman on, on YouTube. And uh, as of we were just talking about this before uh, we jumped on the air, like, holy smoke, she's going to be hosting a late night talk show on NBC, which is like awesome. Uh, we talked about uh, as I remember when we were leaving the stage area and we were talking about uh, our, our it, it was somewhere when we were in San Diego. We were talking about like productivity and how how her process is, you know, like she's like she's she would get all her work done and then go do something like then go do something that would be seem seemingly essential. Uh, <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, you're putting that off to, to do all this other stuff first. You seem to uh, if you want to re- tell that story, go ahead. But it's more about how do you 
how do you work? What's your process? Because, I, you know, you talk about this idea of, um, and I talked to Austin Cleon about this, uh, the idea of process versus progress, right? Like focus on process and, and, and the progress will kind of uh, take care of itself. What's your process look like? Are you the type that's like, go like just digging in and, or, and, and just grinding, or are you more, um, maybe more of a, a, I wouldn't say take it as it comes or get into the flow kind of person? Um, I think definitely, well, back to the Lily Singh story, I think the one we were talking about was using the bathroom. So mm-hmm, I, was, I mm-hmm, said that, mm-hmm. was, that was the key difference between me and her. Is I would say, hey, I'm going to get to work right after I use the bathroom. And she said, I will use the bathroom after I'm done my work. <laughs> and that was the moment I realized that, A, you can put your money on her for life because she is always going to come out on top. And B, that, you know what, I'm okay using the bathroom first and I'm okay with, a, you know, a little bit of a reduced lifestyle quality. Uh, <laughs> My achievement because of that, you know, You'll never get I'm, an NBC just, talk show, I'm yeah. afraid, my friend. You'll never get. Want, yeah, and and that's her that's her natural obsession, and that's how that's her workflow. And I think for me, I'm very self aware that 95 percent of the challenges is just getting started. And if you get yourself, if you can convince yourself, your little monkey brain to 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 get started in that first four or five minutes, then you know you'll you'll get momentum or what people call flow state or you know, you'll start your upward spiral. So um, I'm, I'm a really big uh, believer in trying to get started, you know, getting yourself prepped for it. Obviously, some days are better than others. Um, some activities are easier than others. I think, you know, I'm also mindful that what I'm generally procrastinating around are activities that either I'm unfamiliar with or uncomfortable around. And um, that's also, you know, a compass to where, what I should be focusing on for my growth. So I think in that in, in that process, yeah. And also being mindful of, being busy versus being productive, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can continually do and really being mindful of my to-do list and be like, whoa, okay, what, what's been carrying over to the next day and the next day and the next day? That was actually, you know, in addition to finding out you were Canadian, that was the other thing that was kind of like piquing my, my, my interest when, when I was watching you speak. And I was just like, oh, you know, somebody that I could, you know, kind of just be candid with when, when it comes to, to, my, to my strengths and, and my struggles uh, in the world of getting it done and just to receive some additional insight, because I think it's also like you meet a lot of people who are productive, but a lot of them kind of have this intensity to them, you know, like, like the rock. Uh, and then, you know, and then, and then there's you and, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're calm and you're happy and you're smiling and, but you're very efficient. And I was like, Hey, that's my kind of guy. That's the kind of guy I need to learn from this guy. You know, He's still down to eat some carbs and have some fun. And, you know, and at the same time, it's not just, you know, banging his head against the wall being like, let's go, everybody, let's go, you know. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm along that line as well, which is like, let's get it done. Uh, you don't have to psych yourself out and do, you know, 20 jumping jacks. Sometimes I got it just to wake up. I'll do, you know, 25 push-ups before I begin and get the blood flowing. Um, but I think I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. I'm very cognizant of even like the anxiety that comes with starting a task and how that manifests itself. Um as, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, let me, you know, I need a dopamine drip. Let me go check Reddit. Let me, let me go scroll thumb through Instagram and being very mindful of how, hey, I can't simply rely on my personal discipline and I can't rely on willpower. I have to adjust my environment accordingly. So, you know, writing on a computer that doesn't have Wi-Fi, uh, putting my phone in a completely different room while I'm working. So even if I do have that natural gesture to like grab it, it won't be around me. So really kind of creating these hacks in my environment to ensure I keep working. All right, we're going to take a break from the episode to talk about our sponsor. And our sponsor is me. Uh, It's it's the next big project that I'm working on. And, uh, you know, it's something that I've been giving my overarching focus to as I'm recording this for the past, you know, several months leading up to it. But it's really, I'm doubling, tripling down on it over the course of the next several months, I would say throughout the majority of 2019. And like we're talking at least six months worth of work. Uh, it, it is my next book, uh, you know, and it's basically the book that I've been meaning to write for a really long time. And I can't wait to share it with you. And uh, it, it's the culmination of, of 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 my work over the past more than a decade in the productivity and time management space, and I'm really excited that this is coming to fruition. Uh, you know, so uh, 
right now it we're still in the early stages of it and i mean it seems like i've been working on it for a long time and i'd say i've been working on it over the past decade but you know actively working on the the process of building it over the last uh, little while we're still in that early stages but so much so that we but we do have a page set up where you can learn more about the the project which is, you know, you get updates on it and such. Um, you can learn more about the book. All you need to do is go to bit.ly.com slash next big project. That's bit.ly.com slash next big project. And that way you can learn more about what I'm doing, get updates and, and all the goodies that are surrounding it. So again, go to bit.ly.com slash next big project to learn more about my new book and everything surrounding it. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's some freebies included and all that stuff when you sign up there. So again, bit.ly.com slash next big project. I encourage you to check it out. And I want to thank you for, uh, spo- you know, listening to this episode and keeping up with my work. I really do appreciate it. Now, let's get back to my chat with Humble the Poet. Let's shift back to the book for a bit because I want to talk about, you've got 101 simple truths in, in inside of this thing. And I want to kind of touch on maybe the one, people reach out to you, you said the book wouldn't go away. Is there any one or a couple in particular that people just like they would email you about and say, you know, humble, this is this, I needed this one in particular, or this or these two in particular. Are there any of them that are in there that are kind of like, that, maybe that took you by surprise. It was like, oh, I didn't realize that this was something that people really needed this particular lesson. Oh, yeah. I think uh, I have a chapter called Heartbreaks Are Essential. And I talk about the importance of heartbreaks and why, you know, we, we all need to have one, you know, on our bucket list. And, you know, what we can learn from that. And I'm also very careful to, to recognize that, you know, you, you can, people, you know, at a certain age, you can die from a broken heart as well. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an emotional thing, but it can still have an impact on us. And I think talking about heartbreak and really helping and really kind of painting the picture, I think that helped a lot of people realize that they're not alone. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, when our heart is broken or we're betrayed, we kind of feel like no one else has ever experienced what we just experienced even though there's a million heartbreak songs out there to kind of show us the opposite. So I think that chapter heartbreaks are essential. Um, I also have a, a chapter said it's not selfish to put yourself first. And I really kind of talk about, you know, give a damn about yourself, then give a damn about those you care about and then see if there's any, any dams left to give. And I think really <clears throat> that's counterintuitive because a lot of people find value and uh, putting themselves last and putting other people first. And many of the people they put first aren't people that should matter to them. Uh, so I think really encouraging people to kind of put themselves first um, and not feel guilty or selfish for doing so, even though a lot of people in their life may make them do so. And really kind of remind them that, hey, like you're of no value to anybody else if you know you, your cup has no love in it. So I think that one's that one's always really connected with people, um, reminding people that their biggest battles are always going to be with themselves. So that that that's that, that's a massive one that people really connect with. Um, <clears throat> reminding people uh, another quote is you know life you know life doesn't begin after the obstacles life is the obstacles. So I think a lot of people have that mindset that hey once I get over this hump I can begin enjoying my life and really kind of articulating that no life is the humps all those humps our life and life doesn't begin after them. You know, this is what you're going to be dealing with for the remainder of your existence. So, you know, buckle up and enjoy the ride. Um, so I think it's, it's really going back to unlearn. Like, I don't feel like these are any revolutionary ideas that they probably have never been exposed to. I think they just needed that uh, reinforcement. Cause I think it, it really, it, it, this book really connects with people deeply on, on, on an internal level. And I'm very proud of that. And I think a lot of the reason that happened is because I didn't mean for it to be a book. I feel like this book manifested itself. And I challenge people all the time to, Hey, just grab the book, open it up anywhere to any page. And I promise you, you will find something that you connect with. And, you know, every chapter in the book is only two pages. You don't have to read it in order. You know, you can, you can just take a chapter a day if you like and start with the odd number, start with the even, read it backwards. It doesn't matter. I, I, you know, the, the teacher in me tried to make it as accessible as possible. So let, let's talk about, um, you know, the idea of journaling, because I think that some of this, uh, a lot of people, what they'll do is in order to kind of stay grounded and stay connected is they'll journal. I wonder, first off, do you? And secondly, 
Part of me is thinking the answer is no, because through the art that you make, it's almost like there's a journaling component there, whether it's through song, poetry, you know, uh, film, whatever it's going to. Is that how you operate or do you consciously sit down and go, hey, I'm going to, you know, chronicle my thoughts, my feelings, my activities that, that are either going to happen today or have happened? Like, how does that look like for you? Uh, so for me, there's levels. I think I definitely uh, am a big proponent of put it in your art. You know, I think, uh, you know, a bad a bad moment, a bad experience makes for amazing art. And it also allows for you to kind of l- let it all out. But at the same time, polish it, um, revisit it and kind of stylize it in a way that you can also you don't have to be too revealing, but you're still kind of letting it off, getting it off your chest. Um at the same time, I think it also gives you the opportunity to figure things out. And I think that was the big thing that I kind of, I learned that from Rupi Kaur, actually. Yeah, she was speaking about a very specific problem she had, and she shared a poem about that. And I was like, oh, so how did you figure out the problem and then write the poem about it? And she was like, I didn't figure out the problem and then write the poem. She was like, I figured out the problem by writing the poem. And uh, it's kind of going through process. So I think for me, there is a little bit of that. Um, but as well as when things are very, very heavy and very, very tough and I don't have the, the capacity or bandwidth to even try to be creative with it, then I definitely have a, I just have a Google doc and I just kind of vomit out everything and I just, you know, just slam it on the keyboard and I just keep going until nothing comes out. And I think it's just kind of like getting it all out and and I I don't really reread it at that moment, but I do recognize how it becomes a journey and I start to discover things. So it was like, you know, Hey, I was really upset today because I thought I was going to get to see Mike on the Skype video. And, you know, I really enjoyed seeing his handsome face and he didn't let me see it. And then, you know what, maybe this stems back to, you know, my childhood when my other friends wouldn't make time for me. Like, you know, it'll just unfurl in itself as you go. And uh, I really like that. And I think now a lot of that is helping to, uh, inform my art and the creativity that I make, but I'm a very big proponent for people to the importance of telling your story any way you wish to tell your story. Cause as a species, that's how we've been progressing. So, you know, if, you, if you're going through some shit, write about it, paint it, sing it, draw it on a cave, whatever you want to do. Uh, but that story is essential and it'll add more value to other people's lives as well. And you can leave the details out. People need to, don't need to know everything. They just need to know the core emotions because that's what they're going to connect with. The only reason we're not seeing each other right now, it's early in the morning and I am not my beard. I don't have a beard, but my hair certainly doesn't look as fine as your, <laughs> your beard probably does because we're on the West Coast. I'm like, it's 8 a.m. It's like, OK, let's get started. Are you more of a are you more of a morning person? You're more of a night owl speaking to that, because I think that's I mean, I was up. Obviously, I'm up till about one in the morning. Uh, where, where does or do you have kind of ebb and flow with that as well? Uh, I think it's ebb and flow where if circumstances get me up early in the morning, then I'm always uh, at least once every morning when I'm up early, I'm like, wow, my brain is working so much better and I can get so much more done. I should do this more often. And then, you know, then I, I go on a Brooklyn Nine-Nine marathon on Netflix until like 4 a.m. And I'm just like, ah, oh, crap. So I think it's a, it's, it's a, I, I definitely would benefit a little bit more from the morning, but certain types of creativity, especially when I'm making music, that's definitely a late, a late night process. Um, when I feel like the rest of the world is asleep and, uh, much of the vibes that are existing, um, in the environment, you know, I can kind of channel all of those for myself. Yeah. It's almost like it's sneaky or secretive, right? Like the nighttime almost seems like it's that place for that. I know that when I'm writing, like my best time for writing is at night because it's almost like, okay, it's quiet. Everyone, the day is done for everyone else. Now it's time for me to kind of do my thing. Is that, and again, I, this goes back to when I was doing comedy too, right? Like comedy, you don't have comedy happening, you know, at, at Sunday brunch. It's just, it's not that, that kind of stuff. It's almost like you've, you've looked at the day and then you assess it and you try to, you know, either, uh, he, both humanize it and, hum- and and make it humorous at the same time. I think the same thing happens with certain creative pursuits like you just alluded to. I think absolutely. So I think for me, so if, um, the next book I have drops in, uh, drops later in the fall. And for that process, late at night is when I did my outlining and decided what I was going to talk about and have my points. Um, but I was definitely not in a position to execute it the way I wanted to. So 
I had it all set up. I had my notes ready and then I'd wake up and, you know, immediately uh, go to my desk and just like bang it out and uh, with a fresh brain and kind of like get it all out there. And it was, and that was a lot more execution than expression. So I think the expression happened at night, the outlining, what I want to talk about, what I wanted to say. And then in the morning with a fresh brain, I was able to kind of type it out. And I, that's when I would have those like, Oh, that's a good sentence. Good job. Like, that would come from probably my morning brain, uh, more so than my evening brain. My evening brain was the more emotional guy. My morning brain was like, "All right, let's get let's get to work now." Right. So it's the it's the responsible one, and the irresponsible kind of uh, flighty one is the one that's at night that just needs some kind of just needs to put that kind of stuff together. Yeah, completely. But I think I, I'm working towards kind of having it all done. You know, I I, I do uh, like the, the Hemingway idea of you know writing drunk edit over. Yeah. Right now, I'm outlining drunk and, edit, and and writing sober, and then I'm 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 editing whenever I can. <laughs> the idea of, of this pursuit, because this is really what it is. We talk about creative pursuits and, and 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 what you're working on. Like what this this obviously was a happy accident to a certain extent. Like what what do you think is next? And do you even have a next plan, or is it just kind of like next is what it is? Like it's it's it's. I think a lot of people, especially people listening to the show, are like, okay, what's the plan? What's the end game? What's the what do you what what are your goals for this year? And I don't know if that's always effective. I, I definitely don't think it's effective, especially in the in, in the creative world. I think there's got to be uh, you got to give yourself some space to kind of uh, you know adjust your sails and, and and see where the wind is going and where the wind is taking you. Um, I think all of us have these innate obsessions, whatever they may be. And I think paying attention to those will really kind of help us because I, I think we will end up where those obsessions have always wanted us to be. So I think uh, for those people listening who want to live life on their own terms or for those people listening who have already kind of started that process, I think they're going to see a really big connection between where they're headed and probably what was making them excited when they were five, six years old. Um, so I think for me, I'm realizing that, Hey, I can set a bunch of goals, but the stuff that I was daydreaming about when I was procrastinating, that's actually the life I'm living. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if we get to choose our obsessions, but I think we're naturally kind of, uh, going to be leaning there subconsciously, whether we like it or not. Um, I mean, structured and, and having a game plan, uh, and, and, and identifying the baby steps and watching those baby steps add up to create progress, I think is essential. So for me, I mean, I have a second book. I just finished it last month. Uh, so I was writing that probably from last June to February and, um, that's coming out in the fall. And that was kind of my, okay. And now I'm working with publishers. I got, uh, I'm working with editors. I'm working with, uh, you know, a team. Let's let's see what I can really bring out of myself when I'm uncomfortable. And you know, the revisions, the 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 multiple drafts, the edits, all of that. So, and and I went in with the goal of becoming a better writer. And I kind of went in being like, all right, uh, you know, I'm really proud of what this first book has done and what it's going to continue to do. And I'm very confident it's going to continue to connect with a lot of people. What can I do with the second book to ensure um, a that people don't think I'm just some kind of self-help guru who, you know, who, who thinks he's just flawless. Um, so yeah, I have a second book where I write about all the dumb shit I've done in my life and how that's helped me change my perspectives. When someone picks up the book on learn, when they're looking at it, the one that, that's out now, um, what's your hope? What's your, and, and, and what do you want them to get out of that book that they can use, you know, uh, I, I like to give people a takeaway, like something to take action on that they can use almost immediately, even if they don't have the book. Maybe it's like, hey, listen, you know, well, first course of action, go get the book. The link will be in the show notes. Second, what do you hope that they get out of it that they can take and, and move forward with? I, I think definitely what they what they will take is what they're going to what they're going to feel is this. This was written from a place um, of where they where they probably are right now. There was a desperation on my part to feel better. Life was feeling way too heavy. That that pressure was on my chest. Um, I you know I felt like I couldn't breathe. I stayed in bed for weeks. Uh, I was drinking Nyquil, taking muscle relaxers to feel numb. Um, I felt like things were hopeless. I had no idea what to do, and I was upset, frustrated with the world, blaming everybody. And I had to go through this process to 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 to, to liberate myself out of that. And I realized that. <clears throat> 
again, I didn't have to acquire anything from anybody else. I didn't have to go somewhere and learn something new. I had to let go of my expectations. I had to let go of my idealisms. I had to let go of a vision of a world um, that was kind of taught to me through through media, through fables, through the, the my parents' culture. Um, I had to really take a, an internal inventory. And I think that's exactly what this book's going to do. I, I am beyond confident that anybody who opens this book to any page will instantly connect with it because this was written at that layer uh, of humanity that we all feel and we all have. This this book isn't my story. This book is our story. Um, you know, the details have been left out and it's just about the lessons. We all worry about the future. We all have regrets for the past. We all struggle to stay present. You know, we've all had our hearts broken. We've all felt frustrated that we're not in control of life. Um, and and this, is, this empowers us to take some ownership and be like, hey, well, what were our expectations? You know, what were our idealisms? What were the promises that we felt were broken to us? Why did we think those promises would be kept? Um, and I think, and I, and I definitely know what this book is. It's, it's my, my I'm, I'm just an elementary school teacher who knows how to take heavy ideas and make them feel light. That was my contribution to this. The ideas are, are nothing revolutionary or mystical. And what I'm hoping is this will help jumpstart people's common sense again and help people realize that, hey, I always had this in me. Hey, uh, that lesson that he just talked about, I have an example of that when I was 15 before the world taught me to be afraid of things. Or I, I did that when I was seven. And I think that's what it's going to do. It's going to take people back to their essence. And it's going to help them realize that it was the world um, and life, which is very difficult, has just piled on a bunch of bullshit on top of all of us. And instead of adding more bullshit to that, instead of buying a Ferrari, instead of trying to get a million followers on Instagram, let's shed some of that bullshit uh, so we can let our authentic self get some light uh, and grow from that. Humble, this has been great. Uh, everyone go pick up uh, Unlearn, 101 Simple Truths for a Better Life. Where else can they get uh, stuff from you as we continue along this journey? Uh, HumbleThePoet.com. I got all my stuff on there. I'm a multidiscipline artist, so I do everything from designing clothes to making music to shooting music videos. Uh, uh, go on my Instagram, HumbleThePoet, uh, and you'll see quotes from the book. The book itself it's getting pretty popular, so uh, my book has uh, its own Instagram, which is 101 Simple Truths. And again, you can also see quotes from the book, snippets from the book. Um, there's also uh, snippets from the audio book. So if you know if you're not the reading type, or you're you're enjoying the sound of my voice, and you want to hear the book read to you in my sexy, mumbly, bearded voice, uh, by all means, you know you can get it on Audible as well. But you can also go on my website and, and check out a. Uh, you can check out a snippet right there. Uh, I'm also a rapper, so uh, as a recording artist, I had a lot of fun recording the book and I had a lot of creative license to kind of take it in different directions. So sometimes it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. And that's the magic of that. Humble, thanks again for joining me today on the Productivity Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, brother. And that's how our discussion went down. Big thanks to Humble the Poet for joining me. I had a great time chatting with him. We had actually more to talk about after the fact, especially in relation to the sponsor for this episode, which we'll get to in a second. But if you want to pick up uh, his international bestseller, Unlearn 101 Simple Truths for a Better Life, you can pick it up in all fine bookstores, Amazon. All the links will be in the show notes of the things we talked about, as well as, of course, where to pick up the book. The other link that will be in the show notes is for my next big project, bit.ly.com slash next big project, because that's what Humble and I talked about after the fact, what, you know, the process he went through to put the book together and what I'm doing for this project as well. So again, if you want to keep up with my journey as I build this next big project of mine, the next book in my, uh, you know, author's life, uh, go to bit.ly.com slash next big project to learn more about that. Um, again, big thanks to Humble for joining me on the show. Big thanks to John Polster for producing the show and for Connie for putting together the show notes. 
And thanks to you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you don't want to miss another one, subscribe to the podcast in the platform that you're listening to, whether it's it's Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to podcasts. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the show and leave a rating and review because we want to make the show better. And uh, John and I go through these reviews uh, every so often to figure out what we're doing right, what we need to make improvements on, and that way we can do that. So again, uh, if you liked what you listened to, please leave a rating and review. And if you really liked it and don't want to miss another episode, subscribe to the podcast. That's it for this week's episode of the Productivity's Podcast. Thanks for joining me. And until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivity's Podcast, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. See you later. <laughs>